Every two minutes in the world, there's an EUC rider thinking about hitting his first jumps and feeling helpless. Why? Wheels, gear, mods, pedals, shock. There are just too many things to consider. But today, that changes because I tell you everything you need to know to get started for your EUC downhill journey. Let's go. First, how to choose a wheel. We're not going to talk about prices here because there are not that many candidates, but the ideal wheel for downhill riding should have a low center of mass, no outer shell, high pedal clearance, a swappable shock, MTB grade suspension slider, a 20 inch tire, a moderate weight, enough power not to cut out on you, and a max speed of minimum 70 kph. But what EUC model is this? None, you're right. So you can either wait or choose a wheel between the below EUCs. To illustrate this list of characteristics, let me show you a bit the wheel I'm currently riding for downhill, the King Song S22. Low center of mass, check. It helps a lot with stability. Also, the wheel has a pretty wide stance and it gives you a feeling of a delta. Truly, that's the best stance because it gives you optimal points of contact and therefore maximum control on the wheel. No outer shell. Check. Outer shells are useless. Whether they're made of weak plastic and they're gonna break at the first impact, whether they're made of harder material and they're going to break you when they hit you during a crash. So jumping is fun and all that, but in the hospital it's not gonna be the same. High pedal clearance. Okay-ish. I'd like to be able to raise them a bit more. There are only two setups here and I'm already at the highest. High pedal clearance gives you less chance to pedal clip on roots, stones or anything else, especially when your suspension compresses and your pedals get closer to the ground. Of course, too high pedals will make the EUC less stable. That's why it's important to have a low center of mass to begin with. A swappable shock. Check. If you want to be serious about downhill riding and jumping, you will need Perfect shock. Otherwise you're fucked. MTB grade suspension sliders. Nope. S22 has actually more like a retard grade suspension sliders. Surprisingly, they don't work too bad, but having actual tubes like uh, the MTB forks would definitely be game changer, especially when riding on rough terrain. A 20 inch tire. Check. Look at the size of a MTB tire. Now, look at the size of the S22. Got it? A 20 inch tire makes your EUC swift, maneuverable and gives you a good stability. So there's absolutely no reason why you would get anything bigger or smaller. So you're gonna ask me, but why did In Motion and Bigot lately release off-road 16 inch wheels? Why are they all orange? Same answer. Get it bro? A moderate weight. Mm, Okay-ish. I'd say anything over 40 kilograms is a no-go. But if you're a heavier guy, you could go a bit further. But anyway, it's not in your best interest. You want to have the lightest wheel possible. Unfortunately, that's not really in the manufacturer's plan for the time being, but who knows? Enough power not to cut off on you. I must say, that's not the best wheel for that. It's not a super powerful wheel. But you could be alright if you're not too heavy, if nothing unexpected happens and if you don't do a too big mistake. But unfortunately, when downhill riding, cutoff do happen at certain occasions with that wheel and unfortunately I learned it the hard way. Max speed over 70 kph. Check. The max speed of the S22 is actually 70 kph. Faster would be better, of course, but 70 kph gives you enough speed to hit, let's say, 90% of the MTB jumps you're gonna encounter. Gear! Full face helmet, back protector, and chest protector are non-negotiable. You're gonna be better off with a messed up ankle or leg than with a messed up head or spine. So, invest in your gear, not in your hospital bills. How to choose a full face helmet. Just get a MTB full face helmet and you should be fine. If it has the MIPS technology, it's even better. One thing you should pay attention to is the visor it has to pop out on impact. Otherwise, you could have bad surprises 
when a crash happens. So you must know the helmet will not guarantee you zero injury, of course, when you hit your head, but it will be way, way, way better than hitting your head directly. Mostly ride with goggles. It helps with the wind, the insects, the dirt that can get into your eyes, and it will protect you. So if you don't mind, get a pair of these. My upper body protector is quite chunky, as you can see, but also a bit soft. So it's not too uncomfortable. It's really protective upon impact, and it integrates uh, shoulder pads and elbow pads. I really love it. Saves my life a few times. Only downside is that it's pretty hot. When you face plant, you're gonna land on your hands most of the time. So there's no real reason not to wear wrist guards. You can see that mine have been useful a couple of times. Your lower body doesn't move a lot while riding, so also no real reason not to gear up there. Uh, you can start with shorts. These shorts have been super helpful. You can see the hip pads here, they're super chunky and you often hit your hips uh, while crashing. So I strongly advise you to get these. Same goes for knee pads. Just choose something that is protective but comfortable. Before getting these, I got some Troily Design knee pads. They were more protective, but they were so uncomfortable that I had to ship them back and I took these ones instead. I hit my knee a couple of times. Sometimes it did hurt, but nothing major. Remember, always choose lower body gear that is directly in contact with your skin. It will help it to stay in place during the session. Also, it's pretty low key because it goes under your trousers. Add the shin guards, because why not? They've never been of any use to me during downhill riding, but you never know. Remember, your knee pads and your shin guards should be made of flexible material. Otherwise, you will not be able to fully fit the shape of the wheel with your legs and you will have what we call the pony stance, which is disgusting. And also, you will have pretty bad control on the wheel. Don't hesitate to add ankle guards to protect them from getting sprained or broken. Remember, in 50% of the crashes, you will land on your feet. So I don't want you to go from one wheel to four wheels. So take your precautions. Just for you to know, these ankle guards, um, I'm not sure they're too great. I sprained my ankles uh, many times with them, so I'm currently looking for uh, a better option. Of course, having adequate gear doesn't exempt you from being in shape, which is equally as important when it comes to preventing injuries. So don't forget to train, be fit, be strong, be flexible, don't be a pussy. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, the mods. When you crash, you want your will to be protected, but you also don't want it to send you to the hospital when it hits you. So what should you do? The answer is flexible TPU. Look at this bumper. It's so soft. I can even hit it with no pain. The pads, flexible. Headlights, kind of flexible. The linkage, now it's flexible. So you see the ID. The whole wheel is soft on the outside. Remember, when you crash, you have a 40 kilograms cannonball thrown at you, so be smart and don't let it send you to the hospital. The pedals can also be dangerous, so I give you my tip. I add some flexible silicone that I renew from time to time because it tends to fall down. I never had a hit from the pedals, but they can definitely injure you, so get them secured. Talking about pedals, don't start jumping with crappy stock pedals. Get good spiked aftermarket pedals like these ones. The most important thing about the pedals is that you can adjust the angle. So if you want to have a more narrow angle, you can have it. If you want to have a wider angle, you can have it. So it really fits the shape of your legs, of your feet and your knees. Usually the stock pedals are really flat and it gives you a very bad control on the wheel. Adjustable angle is an absolute must and game changer as it will let you find the right angle for you and gain total control on your wheel. Pads. Get pads that come in one, two, three, four modules or go home. Perfectly adjusted jump pads are a must if you want to be serious about this sport. And paired with good pedals, they are a true game changer when it comes to wheel control. Power pads, you will need them of course, especially for braking. Choose power pads that are both comfortable and slippery here. 
that will allow your leg to slip back and forth while riding. Tire. You will need an off-road tire that is not prone to train tracking. And that's it. Changing your tire is not a game changer to me. I tried uh, three different tires and the change was not so huge. For your knowledge, the stock tire of the S22, that's the one that I'm riding currently and it just does the job. And now we arrive to my favorite moment because finally, I will put an end to the huge amount of fake news I've seen, read or heard about shocks and suspension. Let's put this straight guys. If your suspension suck, so will you. Having the best suspension possible will be an absolute must on your way to greatness. First, let's address the two main issues you can encounter with a wrong shock setting. Number one, you're bottoming out often on jumps. It means that your shock is not strong enough at the end of the stroke and the impact at the landing is handled directly by the linkage and the structure of the wheel. This clearly shouldn't happen as it impairs your control on the wheel at the landing and also it will damage it over time. And it's uncomfortable. Number two, you have no sag. The simple fact of standing on your wheel should compress your suspension usually by 20 to 30 percent. That's called the sag. If you don't have any, well, we got ourselves a problem. Why that? Two reasons. Number one, while landing a jump, your suspension is going to compress and then decompress and it will push you and stop abruptly at the beginning of the stroke, which will make you lose some control over the wheel, which is absolutely not what you want if you want to get ready for the next jump. Problem number two, when riding over a hole, your suspension should act and decompress, pushing the tire at the bottom of the hole so you do not lose contact with the ground. If that doesn't happen, well, you're in for a pretty bumpy ride. So if you're bottoming out, or if you have no sag, you will need to change something about your shock. But by the way, how do you choose your shock? There are basically two main options in the market when it comes to shocks, coil or air. Some misguided people will tell you that coil shocks are overall better than air shocks, which makes absolutely no sense. So today we're cracking down the pros and cons of each of them. Guys, if you like my work, I'll let you five seconds to go like and subscribe. It costs you nothing, helps me a lot, so just help yourself. So five, four, three, two. Fuck it right now, pussy. Coil shocks are more sensitive on successive impacts like roots or stone. But please note that if your linkage sucks or if your suspension sliders suck, you will feel no difference. Coil shocks also have a more linear feel. They require little to no maintenance. They have no tuning possibilities. They are a bit heavier and you'll probably struggle to find the right coil for your weight and riding style. Air shocks are overall less sensitive on successive bumps, but the higher the quality of the shock, the less difference you will have between air and coil. Air shocks also have a more progressive feel. They have an adjustable air pressure that will let you find the ideal resistance for your weight and riding style. They are lighter and on the other hand, they require more maintenance also, an air shock will need servicing every 100 hours of riding or so, and it will tend to heat up on longer rides, which will make it a bit softer. So what can we learn from that? First, consider that these shocks are originally made for two-wheeled vehicles, which means one user has two shocks, front and rear. We UC riders have only one shock for one user. So the constraints at the end of the stroke are going to be far greater than on a mountain bike. As a consequence, you will find in the market shocks going to a resistance up to 750 pounds. At 750 pounds, we are pretty much all going to bottom it out on jumps. So you will need to go higher. Some UC community members propose coil going to a resistance of 900 pounds or even more. The issue is the linear behavior of the coil shocks will probably lead you to have no sag if you don't want to bottom out or bottoming out if you want to have sag. Also, you're probably going to make a blind purchase when you want to get one and you will discover how it feels only once you get it. On the other hand, MTB riders usually go to a shop, try different coils and get the best one for them, which is much more convenient. But if you found a coil that gives you some sag when you're standing on it and that doesn't bottom out, I'm very interested in knowing more about it. So please share your experience in the comments. So you saw it coming. If you want to have no surprise, just go for a good air shock. 
Air shocks will let you all the time in the world to find the right air pressure for your weight and riding style. Air shocks are also infinitely customizable. You can add rubber rings that we call spacers and that will modify the resistance at the end of the stroke. It requires a little bit of work to put spacers in your shock, but it's not undoable if you're not a professional. But if you don't want to do it, you can still contact a professional and he will do it for you. Well, I said a lot. So as a conclusion, I would say, now you know everything. Cheers, bro.